I hope the Boston fans here tonight enjoyed themselves. You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble. We're going to be looking back at nine games on Monday, big performances, injuries for us to be concerned about, rotation queries that we need to discuss. We're also going to preview Tuesday's action uh, with four games coming up for the NBA. Michael Bolton, he is absolutely ready to go. Let's get to it. To All right, what a fantastic idea. That is quite a few options for the older uh, Monstrous line of the night. I am going with Zach Levine of the Chicago Bulls. Levine in an absolutely arduous two overtime slugfest. It was a it was just it was so bad watching it. You just were hoping it wouldn't go to overtime so you didn't have to keep watching it. Not that I had to keep watching it, but I was watching it. Uh, Levine got the victory for the Bulls in, with the game winning free throw, 41 points, including four triples, four rebounds, four assists, three steals, and two blocks. Another Great night from Levine, 52% on 25 field goal attempts, 13 of 25, got to the line a massive 14 times as well, and hit 11 of them. Yes, he did have eight turnovers as well, but the production from Levine was fantastic, and he has been a real surprise packet this season, really performing above expectations in my mind anyway. And that's mainly coming because he is shooting at an insane level. He is hitting 54% of his uh, two-pointers. That is a career best mark. Now, it's not wildly over what, what he's you know, going to do for the rest of the season. I think that it, it will drop back down probably to under 50%. But he did have a season of going at over 50% for the Timberwolves before he hit his ACL. So there there is, I guess, reason for hope that it could stick to that level. What he's also doing is he has doubled his free throw rate this season. And when you're hitting 85% of them and going to the line that often, it's, uh, it's huge for your overall value. He's averaging 28 points with five rebounds and four assists. The usage is absolutely through the roof, 34%. Now, of course, when Lowry Markinen returns, when Chris Dunn returns, when Punch Bob Shiploke returns, he's not going to be, I don't think, using 34% of the Bulls' offensive possession. So that'll decrease his free throw attempts. It'll decrease his uh, his field goal attempts, where he's at almost 20 per game. So it is going to knock some of his value off, where he is currently the 18th ranked player for this uh, for this NBA season, but it's been fantastic from Levine. You just worry that when that when that field goal percentage dip comes and when the usage dip comes, two things which I do think will happen: how far does it knock him down? It's not going to knock him significantly outside the top seventy or outside the top ninety or anything like that. I think he's going to be right around that forty to sixty type zone, and that zone might seem large, but as I talk about all the time, once you get outside the top fifteen, top twenty, the difference between say forty and eighty is so infinitesimally small that it could be half a free throw attempt that can knock you down five or six spots uh, in, uh, in in a, a ranking type scenario. So that's the sort of area I see him going in with a dip in the usage, but more importantly. A, a dip somewhat in that those field goal attempts, which we you know, should knock him down. And I don't envisage him being a top 20 guy for the rest of the season, but he has been unbelievable so far this season. I have got him in a, a few of my leagues, and I'm pretty bloody happy with it so far. Guys, if you own a business and, a, and you are looking for a new way to reach your customers, your company could be mentioned right now. Podcast listeners are 60% more likely to interact with the sponsors that they hear on their podcast. Our demographic is 98% male more educated and higher earning than traditional media audiences. So have your company sponsor this podcast by emailing me at redrockfantasybasketball at gmail.com. Let's go into the next one. It is the... Waiver wire line of the night. Yes, it is the waiver wire line of the night. It goes to Georgie Hill of the Cleveland Cavaliers. The Cavs rotation, we're going to talk about it a little bit later. It is definitely steering away from the front office's uh, idea of let's play all the young guys because it was clearly let's play all the veterans. There is a, It's a complete shit show in Cleveland at the moment with players hating each other, not liking what the young guys can do, uh, coaches siding with veterans. So we got 33 minutes out of George Hill, 22-4-6, four steals and two triples, of course. It came on 10 of 12 shooting. 
a number which is unlikely to continue. Hill is barely outside the top 100 this season, averaging 12 points with three assists. He's shooting the ball sensationally as well. So another one of these ones that's likely to dip. 48 from three, 56 overall from the field. Those numbers are likely to come down. And the minutes, you do feel at some point they are going to dip. He's averaging 27 a night at the moment, but they have uh, they have jumped up in the last two under Larry Drew, 28 minutes and 33 minutes. Now, of course, last game he scored three points. So I wouldn't be looking at this and going, well, this is what George Hill's going to do because he's not going to shoot 83% every night. But the minutes are pushing up, and he is a, a unexciting, un, unsexy back-end 12-team league guy who can provide you that value as your 13th guy. Maybe he's your 12th guy on your roster, but the upside's not there. There's a, your trade possibilities. There's minute reduction possibilities. It was a good night from Hill, no doubt about that, in this game against the Orlando Magic, but the ability for this to stick and continue, is uh, it's pretty limited, I think, for George as we move on. The deep leaguer of the night goes to Langston Galloway of the Detroit Pistons with both uh, Reggie Bullock out and Lukey Kennard the Duck. We saw Langston Galloway jump back into the rotation. Remember, he had been removed from the rotation not that long ago, played 35 minutes and had 21-9 and nine with four triples, four assists, and two steals. He was playing over Kennard at the start of the season. Then that got rectified. Kennard got hurt. The Shark Bruce Brown started in place of Bullock, but it was uh, Galloway who got the big bump here. 20 minutes last game for 13 points with no other stats. 35 today. That's a big bump, but I don't think that Reggie Bullock's ankle injury is all that serious. Canard's shoulder is. So I'm not yeah, rushing to go and grab Galloway. It's only his second uh, double-digit scoring night. The, the last one was against the Sixers as well. So two in a row, double-digit scoring. But these rebounding numbers are fluky. The assists, he had gone uh, five consecutive games without getting a single assist. And yeah, the steal numbers, they're not consistent either. So I wouldn't be looking too much into this for Galloway. But Yahoo is showing a 0% roster uh, percentage for Galloway, meaning 20-team leagues, 18, 16-team leagues. While these injury concerns exist on the wing, then you can get some use out of him in those short term uh, for that short term value in those deeper formats but nothing really to pay too much attention to for the old standard league formats young gun of the night here we go jaron jackson jr 15 points six rebounds uh, two assists for Triple J, but most importantly, five blocks. Now, the efficiency wasn't great. Six of 16 from the field and three of six from the line. But for once, he was able to stay out of foul trouble. You know I've been preaching patience with Jackson and people are, are dropping him and I'm getting a lot of questions say, should I grab him off the wire? I never would have dropped him. It wasn't that he was um, you know, not getting minutes because he wasn't playing well. It's because he couldn't stay out of foul trouble. And look, the last four games look terrible. 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and 23 minutes. This is the first real explosion we've seen in terms of shot blocking. But look at his first four games of the season. 10 and 5 with three steals. 24 and 7 with two blocks. 11 and 7 and 14 and 7 with two blocks. That is a guy that you should never have been dropping. I know that these last four games have been annoying, but again, the foul trouble. And it was something that plagued him at Michigan State, no doubt about that. So maybe you think that will translate. And there'll be nights like this. There'll be nights where he has these games. There'll be nights where he has a 20-minute night. But his ability, even in 20 minutes, to go out and block two or three shots is going to be a guy that I do keep rostered on my squad. I do think that he is going to be a, uh, a, a top 100 guy pretty comfortably and can easily be a top 65 player this season, and we saw why in today's game. I uh, yeah, I, I really did like what, what he was able to do you know, in terms of dynasty value. I had him as my number two guy over DeAndre Ayton and over, uh, over Wendell Carter Jr. I, I stick by that. There is going to be some growing pains, but I, I do think he's going to develop into an elite uh, fantasy contributor as well as an elite NBA player. So Jaron Jackson Jr. is your young gun of the night. I tell a man's not hot. The dud of the night goes to Daz Colson. Larry Nance just missed this one because his own, his, not ownership, his roster ship percentage had dropped to 69%. Giggity. And I used the dud of the night at uh, 70% and over. Uh, so Colson is your dud of the night. Eight, one and two with one steal. Three of six from the line. Two of four from the free throw line. I don't know why Collison is rostered in as many leagues as he as he is. I thought he was significantly overrated heading into the season. He had a couple of strong games there when Tyreek Evans was uh, suspended for one game and then another game where they really did ride those starters and didn't give the bench really much of a look in at all with Nate McMillan. But Collison's been pretty underwhelming. The 147th ranked guy this season, I think he can be better than that. 
but not considerably better than that. One of the things that's that's knocking him down at the moment is he's shooting 74% from the line. This is an 85, 86% free throw guy, so that's going to come up. That'll knock a couple of points back on and give him a little bit of extra value there. But he is a low upside player to me who is seeing his role rightfully reduced because there are other options and you know, other options that Nate McMillan isn't necessarily using like Tyreek Evans. But Collison is just not a guy who I think is a 12-team league player. Sure, you could have him, but if we assess it honestly, he's the worst player on your roster or second worst with absolutely zero upside in my opinion. He's not going to go back to being that top 50 or top 60 guy unless a few injuries befall this Pacers lineup. He just isn't that guy who gives me that pop as that last guy. And we're seeing it now. Look at the production now. Isn't really doing it. And I think this is a a decent facsimile for what he can provide outside from the poor free throw shooting, which again has been a real struggle for Daz so far this season. The plus minus goats. Bam Adebayo had the best net rating of the day, plus 92.6. Hassan Whiteside was out. You know I love Bam long term. I think he's got... Uh, maybe an unreachable ceiling, but a top 25 ceiling in Dynasty in the next four to five seasons. Uh, yeah, of course, Whiteside would need to move on, but he can pass, rebound, score, uh, block, steal, and do it all efficiently. That is the sort of... I think think of a guy like Marcus Gasol in terms of overall fantasy contributions. I think uh, Bam Adebayo can get to those levels. That's sort of where I'm looking at him. Not this season, though, because after this game, he's probably going to move back to the bench if Whiteside's right. And then his role will be limited as we move forward. While the lowest net rating on the night goes to Frank Nilakina of the New York Knicks, negative 88.6. We're going to talk about the Knicks game in a little bit more detail uh, soon. But Nilakina is uh, is struggling to provide much in terms of fantasy value just at uh, just at this point. Guys, I need to recommend you uh, a great place for you to go and use all of your wonderful sports knowledge, but in particular NBA knowledge, to go. You can go and win some money by placing some bets, and the best place for you to go do that is at my bookie. Who you're betting on is just as important as who you are betting with, and that's why I always tell people to go and check out my bookie. They are your best bet this season. Fast turnarounds on payouts, one of the most trusted online bookmaking sites that do that does exist. I would only recommend a service like this to you guys if I knew that it was reliable and my bookie is reliable. You go there, you win, and they pay you. It's a pretty simple transaction. Not every site gets that right, but my bookie does. In-game betting, live betting, the most rewarding player perks in the business, and a great bonus for you guys if you use our code Locked On. My bookie will deposit, will match your deposit dollar for dollar up to one thousand dollars. That is fantastic. Put five hundred bucks in, my bookie will give you five hundred dollars by using that promo code Locked On. So visit my bookie today. My bookie. Use the promo code Locked On when creating your account to get that dollar for dollar. match bonus up to $1,000 reduce. Let's talk some injuries now. Uh, Torian Prince suffered uh, suffered an injury, uh, an ankle. He is doubtful for tomorrow's game. He's been struggling with some efficiency concerns. I think he's going to miss on Tuesday. We'll see how long this uh, impacts him moving forward. Of course, Kent Bazemore, DeAndre Bembry, Kevin Herter, they're going to be the guys who benefit. I'd look to, to, to grab Bembry if he is available just for this short term. He's been playing significant uh, role off the bench anyway. He's not going to be a high scoring guy. Think of a Kyle Anderson type of a player. A very, 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 very mini Draymond Green type of a guy, um, but can have some value if Torian is out. Sammy Decker hurt his ankle today. He wasn't able to return. It didn't look great. He's not. A, he wasn't a 12-team league guy, so clearly if you did grab him in 12-teams, you can move on. Probably in 14-teams, you want to move on. Weirdly enough, uh, J.R. Smith, the plumber, he got basically all of those Decker minutes in the second half. Uh, with uh, Larry Drew again confusing us with his rotations. Russell Westbrook, probably the most serious injury or the most high-profile injury, definitely the most high-profile. He suffered, actually, maybe not. He suffered an ankle injury. It didn't look great. I would imagine Westbrook is going to miss time. His x-rays were negative, so that's a positive. But x-rays check for breaks. They don't check for ligament tears. I would imagine a week minimum here for Westbrook. Probably looking at, at two weeks would be would be a guess. Of course, if Dennis Schroeder is on your way for a while, you go and grab him. Deeper leagues, you look at fat face Ray Felton. You look at Alex Abrines. You look at guys who are going to get a usage bump. Maybe it's Jeremy Grant who gets that little bit of a usage bump when Westbrook misses. But of course, Schroeder is the main guy. And then Abrines and Felton are the guys in terms of follow-on effects from that. 
Norm Powell suffered a shoulder sublux subluxation, a partial, partial separation. He is going to miss significant time. When the Raptors are healthy, he's playing like four or five minutes a night anyway. So this is not really impacting anyway, but this is going to be, uh, you'd have to think it's a, a four to six weaker rather than a, a short-term thing. So not great news for Norm Powell. Avery Bradley didn't play for the Clippers today, had his ankle in a boot. Shea Gilgis Alexander got the start. I'm just hopeful that Shea will uh, keep that spot for the rest of the season. Bradley was providing nothing outside of, say, 16 team leagues. We'll see if there's any further news on Braddles as the as the days go by. But uh, of course, not not a 12 team league player, not really a 14 team league guy either. Well, Draymond Green suffered a foot injury. The Warriors ruled him available to return. And then he didn't start the second half, Jordan Bell did, and then the Warriors said he won't return. So the Warriors have got a couple of days off before their next game. The x-rays were negative on Draymond. We're going to see, if he's, if I had to guess, I'd say he misses one game, and that would give a, a boost to Jordan Bell and to Eunice Yurepko as well. They'd be the two bigger beneficiaries of that uh, injury, but it doesn't appear like it's going to be a long-term thing for Draymond, so that's good news. Um, just yeah, maybe that short-term boost uh, for Yurepko and for Jordy Bell. But you know, we have to wait and see what happens with that over the next couple of days. Let's move in now to talk about these uh, these games, these nine games from uh, from Monday. We'll get into those now. I'm just gonna you know, readjust my face on this uh, on this camera. All right. All right. The first game we look at the Houston Rockets and the Indiana Pacers. Jim Harden, yeah, he was strong, 28, 4, and 6 with three steals. And Clint Capella, a lot of minutes for Capella this season, 35 here. Now, some of that is to do with Nene being injured and also some of the other guys sucking like uh, Marquise Chris. But 18 and 10 with a block, and those 35 minutes are super sexy for Clint Capella. The guy that I've talked about a lot on this podcast, you know, I do go deep sometimes. Uh, shout out to Evan Phillips for the nickname. Uh, Gary Clark, the Comet. Six and six in 24 minutes for Gaz, but he does it defensively. He, uh, I know he played for Cincinnati. I've got no idea what conference the Cincinnati's in because conference realignment has screwed me up with all my college knowledge. Hey, it didn't mean that's a rhyme. Uh, two steals and three blocks. I think he was a two-time defensive player of the year for Cincinnati. A two-way guy in Houston, but he clearly has Mike D'Antoni's trust. He closed the game for the Rockets with Mallow and Jim Ennis both sucking. He has been uh, he, him and Alfonso McKinney, who we'll talk about later, two absolutely fantastic stories with that a lot of players won't even know about. In fact, ESPN Fantasy doesn't even know about Gary Clark because he is not available to add, which is absolute nonsense. Get your shit together. How can you have a guy who's been on a, a roster since the start of the season, and we knew he was going to be on the roster since before that, that's not even available to add, and a guy who is getting rotation minutes and is actually really useful with what he can do. So I think that Gaz is going to remain in the rotation. I don't think Marquise Chris is coming for this role because, again, he is terrible. Clark is providing some really nice defensive numbers, and when you get the coach's trust, like he has with D'Antoni at the moment, it's interesting. Now, he still is outside the top 250, so we're talking very, very deep formats here at the moment, but things are pushing up for Gaza. That's two consecutive games in a row of 20 plus minutes for him. He's had three steals and five blocks along with 13 rebounds and three threes in those last two games. That is very, very useful for the Comet. So keep an eye on him when ESPN eventually adds him, but in your deeper leagues, in your dynasties, I like what Gaza is providing, a guy that translated well coming out of college and we're seeing it here. Chris Paul struggled nine points, but 13 assists. While well, Mallow, 12 team leagues, get him out of here. 14 team leagues, Probably the same. Well, Jim Ennis started and had 13 points, but really more of a, a deeper league sort of a scenario. For the Pacers, Oladipo, 28-6-2. That's nice. Lack of defensive numbers. Again, it is coming home to roost. I don't get anything... I don't get everything right. In fact, I probably don't get most things right, but this was something that I talked about as a real area of concern for Oladipo if you're reaching into the top 10, which some people were. Didn't buy that. Is that those defensive numbers were going to be hard to keep up, and it's proven that way so far. Also with Miles Turner, there's just no upside in him. Seven points, the three blocks are nice, but he is not coming becoming a top 30 guy. Stuffed that up last season, and I didn't see that it was going to change this season, and it's probably gotten worse because Demontis Sabonis is he probably better than Miles Turner? He probably is, yeah. 17, 8, and 5 for Sabonis. Now, his lack of defensive numbers are always going to hold him back in terms of overall upside, but 7 of 9 from the field, one of the most efficient players in the NBA, of course. He shouldn't be on any waiver wires. Tyreek Evans, 16 minutes, 11 points. Now, 
16 minutes is nonsense from Nate McMillan, but he did close the game. So if you're going to have that trust to close the game with him, why is he not, play, why is he not playing more? Corey Joseph's bad. Doug McDirt is bad. Boyan Bogdanovich is average. Darren Collison is not good. Tyreek should be playing these minutes over these guys. Now, he has some frustrating tendencies, no doubt, and maybe the fit with Oladipo isn't great, but the minutes here aren't awesome, and it's a consistent trend. So if he's not getting 25 a night, He's gone as well. Get him out of your 12, get him out of your 10s first. Get him out of your 12 team leagues, I think, especially if there's someone who is worthwhile to add there, there which which there probably is in, in, most, uh, in most circumstances. Let's look at the next game, the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Orlando Magic. I talked about it with George Hill already. J.R. Smith played 25 minutes and had 14 and four with two steals and a block, which 16 team leagues, if Decker's out, 14 teams, maybe you want to have a look at Smith. But the frustration with playing 34 minutes for Tristan Thompson, and I do have to mention, Tristan Thompson did play well, but when your edict from the front office is play the young guys and you resort to playing 34 minutes of Tristan Thompson, then you're not doing what the front office did. There is complete miscommunication. There is uh, there is a lot of um, mixed messages. Maybe we hear that with that Kyle Korver story from Joe Varden of The Athletic, that Korver had an agreement with the front office. If LeBron was to leave, he would be traded in that summer. It never happened. They said they were going to try and compete. They told these players, and these players are, how do they believe it? It's like George Hill signing with the Kings last season. Oh man, you guys fooled me. You said we were going to compete. Like, did he not see the roster and not realize that they weren't going to compete? Um, but you know, this this change, this idea is, is pretty weird to me. The going back and forth. Now, Tristan Thompson putting up some, some solid numbers here. 19 and 16 is fine, but he I, I don't think he's a 12-team league player. He is a 14-team league guy. He's averaging 28 minutes a night so far, but still outside the top 150, mainly because he's free throw shooting so poor. Not a good shot blocker. Doesn't get assists. He's a strong rebounder, and if your league counts double-doubles, he probably helps there. But I'm not going and adding him in 12-team leagues. But what he is doing is absolutely killing Larry Nance, who played only 14 minutes and had 0 and 5, a player that the team said, he is a massive part of our future. I think they may have even used the term cornerstone. They were clearly lying to somebody, themselves, to Nance, to us, maybe to all of us, because Larry Drew is is not using him, and they're using him exclusively as a center. Sam Decker's gone. Kevin Love's gone. Your first and second power forward are gone, and you're not using Nance there at all. He's playing exclusively as a center, and if this is the, the pattern, and it appears to be. Now, I think at some point, Nance is going to get back to those 25 minutes and we'll add him, but you can't hold on at this point because we're seeing you know, Drew do this. They've just announced that he will be the coach for the rest of the season, so there's no um, you know, hope of it necessarily changing anytime soon. I think you have to move on. Colin Sexton's not good. 17 minutes, five points and two assists. And people people you know, confuse me saying not good. Oh, man, he's only young. You've got to give him a chance. I know that. At the moment, he is not good. And I, you cannot debate that at this point. I know he is young. He might become good in three or four years' time. As things currently stand, he is not. Now, I have my doubts that he will become good. You're well aware of my concerns with what he can do on the court and, and from a fantasy point of view. But for now, he's not good. Um, and even if even if he does, does play 30 minutes a night, is he even a top 120 player? I have my significant doubts that he would even get to that level of goodness. So probably not a 12-team league player. Well, Chetty Osman... Man, just cannot hit shots. 17 uh, shot attempts, 5 makes, 11 and 10. I am still holding him in 12, 10 leagues, and I'd move on from Nance. I'd move on from Tyreek. But with Chetty, I am still holding him. The, the shooting has to come back. He's not going to be a 37% shooter for the season, I don't think. 5 rebounds, 3 assists, almost a steal, 12 points. The minutes are through the roof as well. I would much rather have him than Nance. I'd much rather have him than Tristan Thompson on this team, but... It's not great with the field goal percentage for Chetty at this point. On the Magic, Aaron Gordon turned a slump into a pretty you know, pretty nice couple of games here. 23-9, Fournier hit the game winner with 15 points, 5 assists, and 3 steals. He had a struggle to start the year, but he's getting back in, on track, and that's what happens when you have those cold shooting streaks. They are reverse. Muhammad Bamba. One, two, three, four, five. 21 minutes, 6 points, 6 rebounds, and a block. You know he's going to get you a block. He's probably going to get you two blocks most nights. But he's just not going to do too much more than that. Steve Clifford's not a guy who's going to just fully invest in rookies straight from the get-go. He's outside the top 160, despite averaging 1.6 blocks. I don't think that Bumba is a must-roster player. Vooch had 14 and 10 with a pair of blocks there as well. While with Johnny Isaac out, uh, Terry Ross stepped up again. 30 minutes, 15 points, 3 triples. He is a point streamer. He is a 3-point streamer. That's probably where it ends with him. While John Simmons is struggling, I don't think John Simmons is a 12 or probably even a 14-team league guy 
even with uh, Johnny Isaac sitting this one out with that ankle injury. The uh, the next game we look at, the Miami Heat and the Detroit Pistons. Joshie Richardson, this guy is killing it. 27 points, 8 rebounds, 4 assists and 2 steals. The shooting is really, really strong again. Do not ever come to me with a should I drop Josh Richardson question because the answer is no. He is the 27th ranked player this season, averaging 21 points. I laughed at Eric Spolstra. I laughed at Pat Riley. Oh, he's going to average 18 points a game. No, he's not. What are you talking about? He averaged 13 a game. Well, he's averaging 21. Now, some of that will dip when Deion Waiters comes back, when James Johnson comes back, but should it? Because Deion Waiters isn't good. In fact, he's probably better out of the rotation to enable the good players to actually play. Not that this Heat team is really thriving, but Richardson has taken his game to another level. Adebayo had 11 and 8, three steals and a block. We know we love that, but the 29 minutes will go down to 19 minutes, likely when Whiteside returns. Kalil Linick moved to the bench, I guess so that he could be the backup uh, backup center with Whiteside out, but that pushed Justice Winslow into the starting job. Now, I think Winslow is better served as a point guard, but he had 9, 6, and 5 with three steals. The percentages are rough with Justice, but that's two 30-minute games in a row. But again, Will he get that level of a role when both Dragic, who missed the game before, and Whiteside, who missed this game, are healthy? That's the concern with Windsor. Or will he be a 25-minute per game guy? So far in his five games this season, he's averaging 29 minutes, 10, 6, and 4 with two steals and a block. So those defensive numbers are obviously really sexy, but it's double his steal rate from last season. It's, he's never posted anywhere close to this level of a steal rate throughout his career. It's a career-high assist rate at the moment as well. Um, so there are you know, some elements of those things coming back down, and he still isn't a top 100 guy. So I'm not looking at him as a must-grab 12-team league guy. You could try it, but I just worry about when both Dragic and Whiteside are there, does he get squeezed? Scooter Magruder had 8-5 and five with two steals and two threes. He's starting to regress to the guy that we've you know, known and loved over the last couple of seasons, a player who eats minutes and does nothing with them after a red-hot start to the season. I still do think that he is a 12-team league guy, he is a top 70 player on the season, but it is starting to come back down. Um, in the last couple of games, he's had two single-digit scoring games, but in the middle of that, he had 18-4-5 and five against the Atlanta Hawks and a 13-3-2 and two against the Charlotte Hornets. So still maintained that he is worth uh, rostering, but that could change really at, uh, at any time. And weirdly, the Duke Wayne Ellington completely out of the rotation. For the Pistons, Blakey Griffin, huge again, 24-15-7, and, and Andre Drummond, 25-24 and 24 without... Uh, without um, Hassan Whiteside there. And the Pistons made a change to their starting lineup. Stan Johnson went to the bench and the little dog, Glenn Robinson, started. 16 points for Robinson in 13 minutes with two triples while Johnson played only the 14 minutes. Of course, Stan wasn't providing 12, 14 or 16 team league value. Sorry, Kyle. So now, uh, yeah, you wouldn't have had him in those formats anyway, but of course you don't now. We don't know if this is going to stick. Casey said he needed to make the move because they'd lost four in a row. Well, now they've lost five in a row. Let's see if they stick with Robinson. He is far from a must-grab guy. You know, compared to a guy I just talked about with Justice Winslow, I'd rather have Winslow over Robinson because of his ability to contribute in multiple areas. Strong game from Reggie Jackson as well, 25, 4, and 6. While Ish Smith, yeah, struggled a bit. Five assists and two steals is nice. He is a fringe 12-team league guy. The Shark, Bruce Brown, only one rebound in his 12-minute start. The next game we look at, the double overtime Chicago Bulls... Are Quickly, the uh, the Heat and Pistons game was overtime as well. The Bulls and the Knicks double overtime. Wendell Carter Jr., the block Panther, he fouled out in only 22 minutes. Still put up 11 and 13 with two blocks. Of course, a must roster guy. Well, Antonio Blakeney, man, does this guy ever pass? 17 points in 20 minutes, two steals and a block. He's up and down. He's a scoring stream guy. That's about it. Jabari had 15 and 8, and Justin Holiday really uh, underwhelming. We played 47 minutes, and Campaign played 41. Holiday, I'd have over Payne as a 12 team league guy, but only barely, and he is far from a must roster guy there as well. Robin Lopez had key two blocks at the end of the game, uh, replacing Carter because he fouled out, but nothing really too much to see there. On to the Knicks, just real a, a bunch of weirdness here. We had the same starting lineup, and we I find it really hard to trust or believe anything that David Fisdale says. It feels like he has no conviction in what he says or, or follow through. Well, we really like what Robinson's doing as our starter. We've got to get him in there, develop him as a starter, and then you play him 11 minutes. I think he had eight first half minutes with no fouls. And then he played three second half minutes and picked up four fouls. So that's understandable. The fouls just came really quickly in that second half, but didn't play him at all really in that first half. He still had two blocks, but again, trying to trust what Fisdale says is impossible. 
two days before the season. Kevin Knox, he's going to be our starting small forward. No doubt about that. He's got to go through the lumps. He's got to work it out. He struggled in preseason, but he's going to work it out as a member of the starting unit. A day later, uh, he's actually going to come off the bench. Like Literally nothing had changed. No games in there. Robinson, he's our starter. We've got to work through it. Develop him. 11 minutes. You never know what this guy's going to do. He does change his mind all the time. We saw 34 minutes out of Emmanuel Moutier, 36 minutes out of Mario Hezonia. They went with a lineup of Alonso Trier, uh, Enes Kanter, Damo Dotson, Moutier, and Hezonia for all of the two overtimes in the majority of the fourth quarter. So big minutes there. Trier, like Antonio Blakeney, does he ever pass as well? One assist, 21 points. A uh, two-way guy, I think they will convert his contract but remember, Timmy Hardaway was out of this game, so that enabled Trier to start and put up that sort of line. It's not going to be a consistent thing for him. Dotson was strong. Well, Kevin Knox returned and played five minutes. Surely he just wasn't right with that ankle. It just didn't, it didn't make a huge amount of sense to bring him in the second quarter, playing five minutes, and then he was done. While Lance Thomas, I think he is going to be out of the rotation. Only five minutes for Lance here. Um, Trey Burke had 24 minutes. Well, Neil Aquino, I talked about him in the plus-minus section. Uh, really struggled, only 16 minutes. I don't think we need to be holding on to him in 12-10 leagues. And I don't have a problem with a guy like Neil Aquino really struggling and you bench him. You probably want to give him a bit more than 16, especially when Moutier, despite you know, that 16-6 and six for Moutier looks good, he wasn't good on the court. He threw some bafflingly bad passes. He just isn't an NBA-caliber player. But coaches seem to continue to want to go that direction with him and try it out, and it is, uh, it is relatively frustrating with uh with Manny Moutier in that in that situation. So I think Frank is a 12 team league drop. I'd add Knox. I wouldn't add uh, Trier at this stage. I'd still hold on to Mitch Robinson. Let's go on to the Pelicans and the Thunder. Julius Randle was great. Didn't miss a shot. 10 of 10 for 26 points. While Anthony Davis 20 and 8. The efficiency is still not there. The elbow is bothering him, but still played 38 minutes. Still putting up some numbers. If you can attempt to buy low on Davis, I would absolutely do it. Miritich great. Drew Holiday great. 22 4 and 14 for Drew. And the uh, the small four position continues to be an issue. Wes Johnson started 19 minutes. Etwan Moore. Only 16 minutes for Etwan. I don't think he is a 12-team league player. We're still waiting the return of Alfred Payton, who's probably out a couple more games. They're just that. They're, when he is out, I mean, they are in real trouble. I'd love to see them give Kenrick Williams a go. I think that he is better than Wes Johnson. I think he's better than, uh, I think he'd be better than Darius Miller. Maybe not at this point. Uh, he'd be an interesting deep league guy to take a look at Kenrick if he uh, actually gets on the court. Frank Jackson out of the rotation while Timmy Frazier down to eight minutes. And these were the guys that were handling nearly all those point guard minutes when Peyton was out uh, just a couple of games ago. For the Thunder, talked about Westbrook already. Uh, Schroeder had 22-3-2. He's a guy that you grab off the wire. While Georgie, Paulie George, 23-6-8 with four steals was good. And Jeremy Grant, a strong performance from Grandy, 13-6, two steals and a block. The efficiency wasn't there, but I do think that his usage will go up if Westbrook misses time, which is what I am assuming at this point. Grant is still barely inside the top 150 despite playing 30 minutes a game. Uh, so far this season, 11 and 5, a steal and a block. Free throw percentage really hurts you with Jazz. He's not a high efficiency guy. He doesn't hit many threes. He's more of a blocks and steals specialist type of a player. And I'd, I'd prioritize someone like Mitchell Robinson over Jeremy Grant. I just don't see a huge upside in what Jazz can bring. Alex Abrina has played a lot of minutes, didn't get a lot of touches. A 7.9 usage, which is just horribly low. Seven points on two of four shooting for Abrinas, and Terry Ferguson remains one of the worst starters in the NBA. The next game we look at, we go to the Denver Nuggets and the Boston Celtics. Huge win for the Nuggets, 115-107. Kyrie looks back to himself, 31-5-5. A lot of people panicking after taking Kyrie in the second round. He looks good now. The 77% shooting clearly won't stick, but that was something that was impacting what he was doing. His efficiency wasn't at the normal levels. It's fine. Jason Tatum, his efficiency is right off. 35 minutes, 15, 2, and 4 with two blocks and a steal. But you're happy in this regard because the shooting wasn't there, but at least he contributed in those other areas. I was warning of, of what Tatum could do this season. I worried about that efficiency. I didn't think it would be this bad, and I do think it will bounce back. But again, don't expect the level we saw last season. Rogier had six points in 22 minutes. Surely no one is still holding him in 12-team formats. He has got to go. While Horford had a nice 12-4-6. And, and Gordon Hayward, who looked great last time out, eh, not quite back there, there yet. 8-9 and nine in 26 minutes. While Marcus Morris, the hot shooting, had to drop, and it did. It, it stopped. Six points on nine shots, 20 minutes. This is the Marcus Morris I expected heading into this season. He was fine to add because he was red hot. 
but you knew it was never going to last. So if there is someone else out there on the wire and you want to make that switch, if someone dropped Triple J, a switch for Marcus Morris, I think it's the easiest decision that you will make today. I wouldn't have any regrets over a move like that. On to the Nuggets, the Blue Arrow, 48 points, 5 triples, 5 rebounds, and 4 assists for Jamal Murray. He took 30 shots, so that limited what Nick Jokic could do, who took 3 field goal attempts. But the, the Nuggets are winning. I don't think there'd be too much to be concerned about there as a Jokic owner, although the field goal attempt trend hasn't been great the last couple of nights. Um, again, people dropped Jamal Murray at the start of the season. It made no sense. The shooting was going to come back, and he was electric. I'll also never understand why opposing teams get so pissed off at players shooting at the end of a game. If you want to stop them, stop them. If the game's that out of hand, well, you're the ones who let it get out of the hand, man. Just play the game out. Okay, you don't play at 100%, but everyone just stands around and expects them to get turnovers. Just stop them, man. I've got, I just don't have any problem with it. Wancho Hernan Gomez started the second half over Tory Craig. I think that Wancho will be the starting power, uh, small forward moving forward with Fart and Will Barton out. That doesn't mean that he is a 12-team league player. 8-5 and five for Wancho there. It's more of a 16-team league, 18-team short-term value. Trey Lyles is your better option out of that group of guys. Him, Malik Beasley, Tory Craig, and Monty Morris. But Wancho comes in second. I just expect that change to happen. While uh, Gaz Harris. Nice, Gary! He can't really get the, the shot going necessarily. His three-pointers are way off this season, but still, five rebounds, three assists, and three steals with 13 points. It's not bad on a night where things aren't going great for him. Um, let's move on to the uh, to the next game. We are looking at the Toronto Raptors and the Utah Jazz. The assists from Kyle Lowry, man, they just continued. The, the Raptors won 124-111, a comfortable victory, so minutes were lowered across the board, but another 11 assists for him, while Serge Ibaka apparently never misses anymore. 17 points in 14 minutes, 8 of 8 from the field, and he fouled out one of the weirdest lines you will see. His efficiency is absolutely through the roof and I do think it's going to have to come down because he's at like 67% from the two-point range. It is going to dip. Pascal Siakam, another strong game. 31 minutes for Siakam, 16 and 7, but my usual caveat applies. No uh, no fun guy. I'm a fun guy. <laughs> Previously, it was no Leonard or no OG Ananobi. So you know, what, what are we looking at with Siakam here? A top 80 player for the season, 11 and 7, Shooting 61%, like I talked about this a couple of days ago, that field goal percentage is going to dip. The usage will probably dip as well when these guys come back. And he's had uh, 30 plus minutes in uh, four of the uh, five of the last six games. Two double doubles in that stretch. But again, we're talking. No, he's not going to lose the starting job. He's going to continue to be the starter. I don't have any concerns about that. But instead of 31 minutes, it might be 26 minutes. And that pushes him maybe from a top 80 guy to a top 120 guy. I've got him as a top 115 guy on the season with a dip coming in that overall field goal percentage. I think that will come for Siakam. But for now, you roster him, but I just wouldn't be expecting this. Level. He's been awesome. Nobody's denying that, but we are, we do have to reintegrate those 30 minutes of uh, of the fun guy into that. It takes some out of CJ Miles, but we will see two or three or four minutes get lopped off the top of what Siakam is doing, I believe. Grab him, hold him, see what happens, but that's how I see it happening with uh, with Pascal. Valanchunas was strong in a start against Gobert, 11 and 6 in 22 minutes. Just keeps churning out the numbers in limited minutes, while the Jedi himself had 17 points. Hello there. 25 minutes, 17 points, three triples. Good to see some offensive pop. I think he's going to be good, but it's going to be two or three years away. He's not really much of a fantasy asset at this point. On to the Jazz, Derek Favors. 11 and 10, three steals and two blocks. That's nice. The minutes is what's concerning. Only 23 minutes for Favors, continually low. He's more 14 team than uh, 12. Rubio, 8 points, 10 shots, yuck, 1 of 10 from the field. 9 assists and a steal is nice. A perfect 6 of 6 from the line is nice. I would still hold on to Rubio, but I understand the frustration. We had um, Royce O'Neal start for the injured Donovan Mitchell, not Grayson Allen. 11 points for Royce with 3 assists, that's all right. Allen had 9 points in 16 minutes. It was Alec Burks who took up that slack. 22 points in 27 minutes for Burks, but when Donovan returns, he goes back to a limited role, so I wouldn't be looking uh, too closely at what he can do while it was a real turd for Joe Ingles and Jay Crowder. Uh, Ingles is a clear holder, and Crowder's that borderline 12-team league guy that you, you still want to uh, hold on to in most, in most cases. The Minnesota Timberwolves lost to the Los Angeles Clippers, 109-120. Jimmy Butler returned, and Carl Anthony Towns had a big game. 20 and 12, three steals and four blocks. The Towns panic. 
it's alleviating. You can see this being more of the norm. And again, the blocks are really fantastic from Town, something he'd lapped over the last couple of seasons. If he gets his shit together this season and can and maintain this level, then yeah, a top five finish is still in the realms of possibility for Townsy. Taj Gibson, 32 minutes. He'd struggled to get 25 minutes a lot of the last few games. 15 and 9 with two steals and a block. That production is useful, but I don't think that we can really rely upon that on a nightly basis. Well, Derek Rose returned. He started. He had 21, 3, and 4, but it's a pretty empty line. Poor shooting, no steals, no blocks. I still think that he is a 12-team league guy, but these are the, the sort of lines that you know, we'll, we'll get a little bit more often, but of course, no Jeff Teague. My name is Jeff. Josh Okogie played 20 minutes. He was in first off the bench before Tyre Stone, so that's a bit worth mentioning. Now, one of those guys is going to lose their spot in the rotation when uh, Teague is back. I still think it's going to be Okogie. I don't think we can look at this and think, well, he played 20 minutes here, that he's going to remain in the rotation. And even so, 20 minutes of Josh Okogie is not enough to be 12-team or even 14-team league viable. Uh, Tone Tolliver, uh, struggle for him, one point in 16 minutes. Did not take a single uh, shot um, which is weird for a guy that just gets as many threes off as possible. Andy Wiggins, 13 and 6. The steal on two blocks is nice. The uh, shooting wasn't so good. On to the Clippers. Uh, the Polish hammer, Marcin Gortat, out of the rotation. Now, Doc said it won't necessarily be forever, but it is for the time being. So Bobar Marjanovic started. He only played 18 minutes, 10 and 9 with two blocks. He wasn't his usual efficient self. I think that he is worth a 12-team league grab, but his upside isn't as sky-high as his per-36 numbers would uh, indicate because, A, he can't play those sort of minutes, and, B, you know, other teams will start to figure him out a little bit more. But you know, that, that's a solid enough line that you can have a look at him. as I'd prefer him over a Tristan Thompson, say, and see where that goes. Gildas Alexander, only 25 minutes, 6-3-5, a steal and a block. If I've got a expendable roster spot, I'd, I'd grab him just to see whether he sticks in this starting lineup. While Beverly had 10, 6, and 4 in 39 minutes, really pushing forward with the absence of Avery Bradley and Lou Williams. The usage is starting to come back down. 20 points in 27 minutes, but still nice. The table, um, 30 minutes for Montrez Harrell, 13 and 7 with three steals. Make sure he isn't on your wire. He is the priority over Boban, in my opinion. While Toby Harris and the Rooster, Danila Gallinari, they both scored 22 points. Nice performances from both of those blokes. The last game that we take a look at now is the uh, Memphis Grizzlies and the Golden State Warriors. Shelvin Mack again, man. 24 minutes for Mack, 15 points, 3 assists, a steal and a block. He is contributing. That is giving him some 14-team league value, weirdly enough. Gasol was strong, and Kyle Anderson, this is what Kyle Anderson can do. Only 4 points, but 4 rebounds, 5 assists, and 4 steals. That is the sort of numbers that can make him a top 100 guy. If he was on my wire, I would look to grab him. He'd been disappointing to start. The minutes are pushing back up, and he is starting to look more comfortable. If you're looking for points, look another direction. Go and add Terry Ross. Go and add Alonzo Trier. Go and add Antonio Blakeney. But if you want con contributions in other areas, well, that's what Kyle Anderson can do. Garrett Temple had 13, and Mike Conley struggled a bit in this one, 9, 1, and 5. It was a predictable blowout by the Golden State Warriors. On to the Warriors, Durant and Steph, they didn't have to go full steam ahead. 22 and 6 for Durant, th uh, 19, 5, and 7 for Steph. But my man, Alfonso McKinney, added again. 29 minutes, 14, 2, and 3. You've got to add him in 20-team leagues. You've got to add him in 18-team leagues. He is a consistent part of this rotation, and he looks bloody good. He's not going to really threaten 12-teamers, but there are going to be plenty of blowouts like this for the Warriors this season, and he is going to get extended run. He is clearly ahead. Now, it's helping, I guess, that Andre Iguodala was out in this game. Sean Livingston was out. Patrick McCaw is unsigned, although he's well ahead of, of Patrick McCaw, and he's clearly well ahead of Jacob Evans. He looks excellent. The centers, uh, Jordy Bell, two points in 21 minutes, two rebounds, two assists. Even if Draymond misses, I wouldn't say that he would be a must-grab. He has been... Uh, relatively underwhelming. Kevon Looney might be able to have some value if Draymond Green does happen to miss time. All right, guys, let's look at the DFS action now. Perfect lineup over on DraftKings. Jamal Murray, 60.25, and Langston Galloway, 43.25. Joshy Richardson had 48, and Derek Favors, 36. Andre Drummond, 63, Georgie Hill, 44, Paulie George, 52, and Ennis Cantor, 65. Uh, that totaled 411.5 for a total of the full 50,000 on DraftKings. On FanDuel, you're looking at Kyrie with 54.5 and the Blue Arrow. He had 55, Galloway, 41.8, and Levine, 
48.8. Joshy Richardson, 47.6. Paul George, 53.2. Derek Favors, 38.5. Taj Gibson, 35.1. Ennis Cantor, 61.3. For a total of 445.8, and that cost $59,800. Dollary dues. Let's look at these games. It is only a four-game slate uh, for Tuesday's action. Let's look at DraftKings pricing mainly today. The first game we look at is the Atlanta Hawks and the Charlotte Hornets. The Hornets are favored by 11, the largest spread of the day. A total of 233. The Hawks teams going up against the Hawks has been great for opposition, but the blowout risk here is something we do need to pay attention to, I believe. Uh, Trey Young at 7,300 as a point guard has been playing some pretty good basketball and giving us some nice fantasy numbers. I think that he is a strong cash option, whereas Kemba at 9,300, we love that. But if he plays 29 minutes against his Hawks team, that's somewhat of a concern. I did mention it earlier that Torian Prince is doubtful to play with an ankle sprain, so that's going to open things up even more in this game. Tone Parker at 42 is coming off a pretty strong stretch of performances. Uh, averaging 30 over the last three, but I don't think that there's a huge amount of upside there. Well, Jeremy Lin at 39 is an interesting tournament guy with the absence of Prince. Maybe it pushes Bembry up to small forward more than point guard, and we get a little bit more Jeremy Lin there at the two as you know, at the two and the one, and Bazemore pushes up to the three also. So I wouldn't be adverse to throwing Lin into a tournament. Kevin Huerta, another guy at 3,300 who could be an upside tournament guy to get some extra minutes, while I love Bazemore in cash, 5,900. But Tombs at 65, that's pretty rock solid also in this game. Lamb and Monk, yeah, look, they're okay. Monk more for tournaments, Lamb more for cash, but they're not super selling me. I do love DeAndre Bembry, though. 4,300 for Bems. I think a 25 or 26-pointer is relatively realistic as an expectation, assuming he gets the extra minutes, which I think he will. I don't know that he will start, but I think he's going to get a lot of those Tory and Prince minutes. Miles Bridges, more of a, of a tournament play. And then on to the bigs. Alex Len at 4,700. He's getting consistent enough minutes that I think that for cash, he, he's not a bad guy. Zeller, The Undertaker, Bill Hernan Gomez. I'm not really sold on, on any of those guys uh, for their overall value in this one. On Fangio, a similar bunch of guys that I do like. Bazemore, Kemba at 9-2 on Fangio, a lot more appealing. Bembry at 49 is strong. And Huerta at 36, I think, uh, is a good tournament guy. And Len at 54 also gets a bit of a boost in value over there as well. The Washington Wizards and the Dallas Mavericks. The Mavericks are favored by one. The total is 225.5. We've got Dwight Howard versus DeAndre Jordan. Injury-wise, Luka Doncic is questionable with his ankle. Devin Harris is out. Dirk Nowitzki is out. Well, Otto Porter is probable with that uh, troublesome toe that he has been dealing with. Let's look at the uh, let's look at the point guards. Dennis Smith is at 5,700. I love that for Smith. He averaged 39 against the Wizards last season. If Doncic is out, look, his efficiency may not be there, but he's going to get more touches if, if Luka happens to sit. I love him at that 5,700 price tag. While Wall at 88, I think he's also a strong player. I'd prefer him over a Kemba Walker, uh, for example, as one of your higher price point guards. Doncic at 77, if he plays, I think that's worthwhile. For now, I just look at it more for tournaments. Berea and Rivers, no. Nah. Shooting guard, Wes Matthews at 5,100. I think that he is more, he lean more towards tournaments because if Doncic is out, he's going to still continue to take shots. And there's something wrong with this Dallas team at the moment. There's some uh, dysfunction going on with uh, DeAndre uh, Jordan stealing that rebound of Doncic, just not quite buying into the fact that he is by far the best player in this team. They're not they're not ready to accept that just yet. They, they Hopefully they come around to it. Wesley Matthews, 7,400. Not Wesley, sorry, Brady Beal. 7,400, I love that. That's really, really strong floor value for Beal in cash. Ubre not really doing it for me at 4,900. At small forward, Porter and Barnes, I uh, no. Can I, yep, we'll just, yep, we'll just leave it at no. Uh, Markeith Morris is uh, small forward eligible as well. He's at 5,300. Big game last time for Markeith, but you can't rely upon him for consistent value, especially with Dwight Howard back. I love DeAndre at 7,900. Uh, some strong games against Gortat and the Wizards before. Howard is a little bit of a different matchup, so it may not go quite the same for DeAndre, but 7,900, I feel pretty okay about that. And I also like Dwight at 61. I could match those two guys up against each other. I don't think that they'd necessarily limit each other, so you could actually put them together in a cash lineup or, or a tournament option as well. Mahinmi and Dwight Powell, of course. We don't need to get too uh, bogged down in looking at those blokes. The next game, the Brooklyn Nets 
I actually, did I talk Fangio? No, I didn't. Let's talk the Fangio options here. I love DeAndre at 86. I like Dennis Smith at 65. I like Wes at 56 as well. And Dwight at 68. Doncic, 81. Again, it's pretty hard to rely upon if we don't know the status of his ankle. Otherwise, uh, I'd feel okay about using Doncic at that $8,100 mark. The next game, the Brooklyn Nets and the Suns. The spread is even. Uh, we've got a total of 220 5. Both of these teams had some big wins in their last outing. TJ Warren is questionable for the Suns. Damari Carroll is close to returning, but he is doubtful, so unlikely to play in this game. Isaiah Kanan, 3,800 for Kanan. He's getting a lot of minutes, not really doing too much with it, but in a, in a pretty strong matchup here against the Nets, I don't mind using Kanan, especially on a four-game slate. Dinwiddie's at 4,800. I think that's a, a pretty solid floor number as well. It was a D'Angelo Russell game last time, so maybe it's a Dinwiddie game this time, and I think that's something that we can have a look at the pattern between those two guys alternating performances. Not saying it's your turn, my turn, but it tends to work out close to that, so I do like Dinwiddie here as an option. Uh, D'Angelo at 6,000 would be in play, but I think there are better point guard uh, better point guard options around. Devin Booker's at 8,200. Rock solid floor, 55 point upside. Very, very tough, I think, to go past Booker at that salary. Well, Jumpin' Joe Harris at 46. I think a little bit overpriced, Jumpin' Joe. Small forwards, McCall Bridges look to be clearly the Suns' best wing option ahead of Joshy Jackson, Troy Daniels, those sort of guys. 3,400, I like it. If TJ Warren's out, it boosts his value even further. Uh, he had 23 points uh, for DraftKings points last game. Really inter interested in McCall at that really low price. The blue swimmer is a nothing. Well, TJ Warren at 5,000. If we hear that TJ is playing, then I love it at 5,000. He should be able to get you you're close to 30 in, in a pretty strong matchup. Ariza at 4,900. The production for him has been good. 32 points over the last three. If Warren is back, does that impact Trev? Maybe a bit, but I don't think that he is a terrible play here. While Karis LeVert just crushing almost every night with a 41 average over his last three, 7,200. The Suns have no defenders who are really going to be able to slow him down. He's going to get whatever he likes. He's good. It's simple as that, and he is a, he's a relatively strong play. Where Josh Jackson is the opposite of a strong play. Rondé Hollis Jefferson. 4,800 really broke out last game. I'm not fully ready to commit to him, but 4,800 is a dirt cheap price for Hollis Jefferson, so I'm happy to go in with him. This is a really stackable game. Uh, two teams with poor defenses, close spread. There's some value there. I love DeAndre Ayton at 75. I love Jarrett Allen at 52. Really strong center plays, both of those guys. You know, ahead of, say, the DeAndre Jordan-Dwight Howard combo, these are the two guys that I'd be looking to, to, to use Ryan Anderson, Ed Davis, Rashawn Holmes, very little for us to uh, get overly interested in with those blokes. On Fangio, similarly, Kanan, Hollis Jefferson, Bridges, Aiton, Jarrett Allen, they all have some pretty considerable cash and tournament value. Booker at 8,100 as well. You've got to love the floor on Devin Booker. Let's go on to the next game. We have got the uh, Milwaukee Bucks and the Portland Trailblazers. This game started with the Bucks minus one. It has moved into evens. The total is 229, a close spread. Uh, it should mean we get big minutes for Giannis, Chrissy Middleton, Eric Bledsoe, Dame Lillard. So this is a real stackable game as well. And we've got a bunch of studs. Maybe we don't have as guys who are as uh, favorably plot priced as the Suns Nets game, but still some value to be had here. CJ McCollum's at 6,200. I, I don't no, not for me. I just don't really feel him at the moment. Lillard at ninety six hundred. I feel good about the Bucks. Um, yeah, defense might be a problem there with with Milwaukee, but I think that Lillard at ninety six is a pretty strong cash play. Better than say a Kemba Walker. Probably not quite on the same level as John Wall on this slate. Bledsoe's down to sixty three hundred on DraftKings. I'm all about that. Struggled against Boston, but he always does. A forty point offering, I think, is a real possibility here for Bledsoe. So that's a, that's a strong play to me. Uh, shooting guard options, Middleton's at 7,000. Great record against Portland. Averages 38 the last three times. Happy to use him at that price. Not the strongest play, but happy to use it. You've got Source Castillo, Malcolm Brogdon, Evan Turner. None of those guys really standing out too much. The Chief, Al Farouk Aminu. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. 5,400, you know the drill. Tournaments for Aminu, that's really about the only time that you can use him. Well, Yanni Atatokounmpo, 12,600. 
he can get 60, but that's really high on a four-game slate. Will you be able to find enough cheap guys to slot in around him? I wouldn't be penciling him in as the first guy in my roster. I'd be comfortable going in other directions with a Booker Aiton combo, for example, and saving some of that money. Um, but we know that Giannis is solid. We know he's going to be a 50-point type of guy, but at 12-6, will he get enough to bring that value back? Mo Harkless is out for the Blazers, so that means Myers Lend or Caleb Swanigan can get a bit of a boost, but they are, of course, just real tournament flyers. I love Nurkic here, 6,700 for Nurk, um, you know, coming off a real strong stretch of games, 38 average over his last three, another strong center option. You pair him with the Allen and Aiton guys there, probably my top three centers on the slate ahead of DeAndre and ahead of Dwight, but a lot of really strong centers on, on this slate with their pricing. Ilya Sover at 42 has been consistently up producing that, a 27-point average over the last five. I don't mind that for cash. I think there's a solid enough floor there with Ursan. Brookie Lopez at 43 is more just your upside play, but he has killed the Blazers. 36 average over the last three. So there's something to look at there with Lopez in terms of your GPP type upside. On Fangio, the pricing's not quite as kind. Lillard at 10-1 and Yanni at 12-8. So I like Yanni more on Fangio than DraftKings, uh, while the chief Al Farouk Aminu at 5,100 is your tournament guy. But Nurkic at 76, you know, takes a little bit of the shine off. I'm not a massive Zach Collins fan on this, uh, on this slate either. Let's go on now and just uh, and break down the studs and value plays across the site. On DraftKings, I like Johnny Wall at 88 is my high price guy. I'm going to talk stud on DraftKings I'm, and Fangio. I'm talking 8,000 and over. My value play is DeAndre Bembry at 47. My Fangio stud is DeAndre Jordan at 8,600. And uh, my value is Bembry at 4,900. My Yahoo stud is Johnny Wall at 39. And my value is Jumpin' Joe Harris at $11. On Moneyball, it's DeAndre Ayton at 85, and my value play over there is Bembry at 52, a common name you'll see. And then on Draft Stars, Dame Lillard at 16.670 is a great option on Draft Stars against the Bucks, and my value play is McCall Bridges, barely above minimum. The best bet today pushed. It was a total of 238. It went over. The game ended up 238. I'm going with another total. Nets, Suns, over 220 and a half. Can't push that one. So that's the one we're looking at. Make sure you're checking out the Locked On Podcast Network on Twitter and Instagram at Locked On NBA Net as well. Check out our sponsor, MyBookie, with that promo code Locked On and leave a review. Five stars, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, thumbs up, comment. You know the drill. Guys, we are getting out of here. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Dr. Michael Malone.